In this series of videos, we'll look at what America was like in 1836. And much of that had to do with the continuing growth of the early Industrial Revolution. Obviously, the Industrial Revolution is going to explode after the 1830s, but it was picking up steam in the 1830s, pun intended. In this first video, we'll uh, look at some of, the, some of the ways the Industrial Revolution was changing America. By the 1830s, of course, Samuel Slater's textile mill had been uh, created and the outwork system was going strong. But you're really going to see in the 1830s, all of this process sort of culminate with the actions of Francis Cabot Lowell and a, a fellow group of Boston entrepreneurs. They're going to consolidate, consolidate and mechanize all aspects of clothing production. Uh, you know, the, the spinning, the weaving, the dyeing, everything, uh, in a way that neither Slater nor the outwork system had done before. And this is really going to become sort of the, the model for the growing factory system. What sort of made this unique was taking a, a cue from the uh, outwork system, Lowell staffed his factory with young women. And he called it the Boston Manufacturing Company, but it, it really became known as the, the Waltham System. And he recruited these young women from farms by offering them higher wages that, than they could earn in the outwork system. And, uh, you know, they, they're going to take that opportunity and, and actually leave the farms to go live uh, at this factory. Located in Lowell, Massachusetts, obviously named for Francis Cabot Lowell, the Waltham system housed these young women in dormitories. Now, to reassure anxious parents, he promised strict curfews, no alcohol, and required church attendance. And he provided cultural activities, such as evening lectures. The boarding houses were staffed by middle-aged women. You know, and, and by 1830s, Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, the Waltham system employed over 6,000 young women, completely regimenting their lives. Uh, you are going to see by 1836 other firms in Boston beginning to adopt the Waltham plan. And by the 1840s, young women made up a majority of all workers in the rapidly expanding textile woolen industry. Soon, by the late 1800s, factories even began to employ children. But that's, that's much later in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, as a matter of fact, you, you, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures like this one here. Most of these pictures were taken after the 1830s because of the development of photography, but uh, it's a, they're still you know pretty indicative of, of the points I'm making here, and so I'm gonna include them in uh, in all these slides on the American 1836. Attendant to the growing early Industrial Revolution was rapid improvements in communication and transportation, especially in, in ocean travel, which made international trade increase. In fact, the first week of 1818, ships of the Black Ball Line inaugurated a weekly transatlantic packet service between New York and Liverpool, and that was the first regularly scheduled transatlantic commerce. They were known as the Black Ball Line because they had a black ball in their sails, and you could see it from far away, as shown in this picture here. By, uh, well, after the Panic of 1819, the packet business grew in a, in a tremendous rush, and by the end of the 1830s, 52 Two transatlantic lines ran square riggers on schedules from New York with three regular sailings per week. By the early 1840s, regularly scheduled ships began to sail from other American ports as well. I should note as an aside that the sleek and super fast clipper ships shown here, they, they were almost twice as fast, came out a little bit later in, in 1845 and that dramatically increased uh, transatlantic commerce and travel. By 1836, you begin to see the very beginnings of the railroad industry, which of course would transform everything. Among them, it, it ended the Canal Age. Railroads could carry uh, heavier goods faster and cheaper, and they were no longer dependent upon water, and thus they could extend further inward and westward. You know, you might think of the old saying, the, uh, in the 18th century, rivers were key to founding of cities and commerce in the 19th century, the railroads, and of course later on the 20th century, the interstate system. People had tried to apply steam to carriages, but it was so primitive that in the, in the roads were so rough that they, they couldn't do it. And But they found out that if they 
put these wagons on rails, there was less resistance and they could go further. And here you can see a, a very early early railroad. But by 1836, railroads are still, you know, a novelty, very primitive, and they were unconnected. You really see a tremendous growth in the railroads later on in the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, by that period, you've got almost 26,000 miles of track laid. In the 1830s, some visionaries could project the future. Construction engineer Robert Mills, for example, was ridiculed when he said that one day Americans could cross the continent coast to coast in only 60 days. Speaking of communication and transportation, throughout the 1830s, inventors in Europe were working in electromagnetic communication. And in 1837, the first electric telegraph was patented. Soon, however, Samuel Morse, a well-regarded painter who had studied in Paris, invented the first single wire telegraph and a code to interpret the signals, a series of dots and dashes that, of course, became known as the Morse code. The importance of this, of course, can't be overestimated. It's right up there with, with the spread of railroads. This meant instant communication. Uh, as fast as electricity could go, you, and you begin to see wires build up. Now, this was going on really in the 1840s and uh, in the 1850s, but uh, you do see the uh, beginnings of it, very end of the 1830s. Not surprisingly, you're going to see the growth in cities, and uh, a number of western cities were starting to become quite big at this time. Uh, they included, uh, just for example, Pittsburgh in western Pennsylvania, Cincinnati and Louisville, all shown here. Not surprisingly, since Robert Fulton's steamboat had been improved upon, the city of St. Louis is going to grow tremendously. And that was uh, the probably the biggest port on the Mississippi River, all trade coming down Mississippi outside of New Orleans. And, uh, you, you know, at the port, at the wharf in St. Louis, you would see all these uh, steamboats lined up. First among the big cities was New York. New York in the early 1830s really brimmed with energy. The harbor, of course, has been a thriving port since the 1700s, but the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825, linking the city with the vast agricultural resources along the Great Lakes, really solidified New York's centrality to the national economy, and it was growing tremendously in the 1830s. Now, if you're familiar with New York, it, it, pr it wasn't much settled uh, past about where 14th Street is today, or at least it was sparsely settled. But for its day, it, it was pretty daggone big. 250,000 people lead there. And you would see, you know, bankers, speculators, craftsmen, shipbuilders, cart pullers, canal diggers, workers, and every type of manufacturing trades just jamming up that city. Now, it, it's really going to remain America's first and foremost city, a major port for new immigrants. And not surprisingly, you're going to be, begin to see real significant visible class and ethnic divisions within New York society. Uh, even this process had begun by the, you know, well, well going by the 1830s. Here in this picture, you can see a map of New York as well as see to, a picture today of them uh, repairing or I think they might even be tearing it down, sadly enough, a, a factor, old factory house from the 1830s. New York had new sewers, and there's better street paving, and water mains were installed and improved upon, and, and by the 1830s, there was service by horse-drawn buses in the city, and you can see, a, again, a picture from later on, but as, as sort of a representative of what they had in the 1830s. By 1836, a uh, multi-line railroad ran the length of Manhattan and uh, north to south, so the city was rapidly growing northward on Manhattan Island. But like any densely, sit, a densely populated city, there remained the problem of uh, fire. And in 1836, New York was still recovering from a, a great fire that had happened uh, the year before, wiping out a, a great part of the city. Another part of uh, living in a densely populated city was the spread of disease. And in the 1830s, a, a cholera epidemic hit New York City, and and you can see uh, pictures of a flyer of that today, uh, here. Today, of course, as I, I talk, uh, New York City's 
uh, in a virtual meltdown because of the uh, coronavirus. Uh, so that, you know, more things change, the more they stay the same. A lot of the uh, spread of disease and the growth of New York City and all that kind of tied into the fact that immigrants were just pouring into New York City. So many that in the 18, by 1830s, they had taken an island off of Manhattan, off the tip of Manhattan, and uh, created the Castle Gardens, which was the nation's first immigration processing facility. And again, you can see a picture of it that was taken later on. But uh, this was is going to be followed in years after that by Ellis Island. Of all the different immigrants pouring into New York City in the 1830s, one of the largest number were from uh, were Irish Catholics. And the Irish Catholic populations will grow even uh, more in a couple of years after that because of the great or uh, the, the infamous potato famine, which began in uh, Ireland in 1845. In any event, this concludes the first video, sort of just describing the early Industrial Revolution uh, and that, what it was like in, in the 1830s.